chapter 12. <clears throat> well, I'm looking at a strange phrase tonight when you stop thinking at it, it's strange. And that is the phrase, one another. Now think about that a minute. One another. What in the world does that mean? One another. We know what the word one means. And another. And what's that phrase, one another, mean? Somebody help us. Give us an idea. One another. Well, that might be a reciprocal attitude, back and forth. Uh, yeah. Pardon? People were in contact with. People were in contact with. All right. Well, it's kind of an interesting and strange phrase. So, I want to consider that this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness, for your blessings. We thank you for this opportunity to be here this evening. I pray, Lord, that you might give us hearts of rejoicing, that we might pray and see answers to prayer and see you at work in hearts and lives. We thank you for your goodness and we praise you for your faithfulness. The Lord, just help us to depend on thee and now teach us from the word of God tonight that we might understand this concept of one another. And so bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, one another. I guess that means this person linked to that person, one person and another person, and the relationship between those two. Now, the local church is a local body of Christ, has many members, but they're all connected with one another. That's how we use that word. In a local church, we're all parts of the same body. Now, notice that concept here in Romans chapter 12. Verses 4 and 5. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. Somebody read those two verses for us here. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. All right, here we are in a church. We're one body of believers, and we are all parts of that same body. And he says, so we're not the same. All members are different, but everyone is members one of another. There's that phrase, one another. Uh, go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 12 chapter, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that same concept here. Uh, notice verse 12. Somebody read verse 12 for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Somebody? For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. All right. In your body you have all kinds of different parts, all part of one body. Then go down to verse 25. Somebody read verse 25. All right, members, one for another, caring one for another in the same body. And verse 26, somebody? Anybody there? All right, one member with the others, suffering, rejoicing. And verse 27, somebody? You, he's writing to a local congregation, church in Corinth. You, he said, are the body of Christ and members in particular of that body. One more passage, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25. Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You people in the church of Ephesus, you are members one of another. And so the illustration, of course, is to your body. And you are kind of, in more than one way, you are kind of attached 
to all the parts of your body. Number one, they're all hooked together, attached. And number one, you're kind of uh, kind of like the parts of your body. And uh, they're all important. You need every one of them. And you don't really like to part with any of them. Now, a while ago, Duart had to part with his appendix. And uh, he didn't like to part with it, but he did anyway. And uh, we just have many parts in a body. And all the parts are important. And we need all the parts and you know, like all the parts. And uh, that's the same way in a church. In a church, we are members together in a body. And uh, what's our, but the question is, what is our relationship with the other people in the church? Paul says we are members one of another. And so thinking about that phrase, one another, this evening. It's approximately, I didn't count it out exactly, but about 40 times in the New Testament. You see that phrase, one another. That's a pretty common phrase. That's rather unusual for a phrase like that to be used so many times, 40 times. And uh, the question is, do you feel any responsibility to other parts of the body? Well, too often we say, well, I'm doing my thing and they're doing their thing. I have my problems, they have their problems. I have my sins, they've got their sins. I have my interests, they've got their interests. And I have enough to do to take care of me. They've got to fend for themselves. Not too concerned about them. But that's not the way it ought to be. We ought to feel a responsibility to one another and a care one for another. Now, the first and most important responsibilities to one another, and that responsibility which encompasses all others, is love. Thirteen times in the New Testament, it says, love one another. Thirteen times. John 13, 34, a new commandment, Jesus said, I give unto you. What's the new commandment? That ye love one another. John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. John 15, 17, these things I command you, that ye love one another. Romans 13, 8, Owe no man anything except to love one another. 1 Thessalonians 14, 9, For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. 1 Peter 1, 22, See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 John 3, 11, This is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. 1 John uh, 4, 12. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And 2 John verse 5. That which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. Well, 13 times. Love one another. Now let's look at that more carefully. And you have your note sheets there. First of all, in our relationships with one another, there are some things that we shouldn't do to one another. Shouldn't do to one another. Number one, we should not judge one another. Turn back to the book of Romans chapter 14. Verse 13. Jot it down in your note sheet. Not judge all these are one another. Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Let us therefore, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Let us not do that anymore, he says. Now, what do you mean? Well, judging in the sense here is to criticize, to condemn the other person for what that person has done. Oh, he did the wrong thing. She shouldn't have done that. Uh, why, they did a bad job. Now, that's uh, judging one another. Now, we're not talking about scriptural principles here. A sin, when God says something is sin, it's sin. They, people had head not do that. Uh, when the Bible says you shouldn't do something, then you shouldn't do it. When the Bible says something's wrong, it's wrong. Uh, but we're talking here about other matters. 
Uh, don't judge other matters. Don't judge people for their conduct, their mo uh, emotions, uh, their motives, rather, uh, not in a scriptural sense, but in other senses. Uh, don't be analyzing what everybody says and does to see if it's whether it suits you or not. You know, it's easy to be an expert on what everybody else ought to do. Uh, Paul said in another place, who are you that judges another man's servant? In the days of slaves, uh, if that slave was working for that man, you didn't criticize him for what he was doing. It's none of your business. He's that person's slave. And if we are servants of God, if you are a servant of God, nobody else uh, should be analyzing your service to God, unless they're in charge of what you're doing or whatever, uh, and you shouldn't be analyzing their service to God. That's uh, judging them, and he says we shouldn't do that. So we should not judge one another in the sense of just finding fault with them. A second suggestion, he says, don't be a stumbling block to one another. Right here in Romans chapter 14, that same verse, verse 13, Romans 14, 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Don't do something to make your brother fall or trip. Remember when Paul was with some people who were kind of uh, a little bit confused on this business of eating meat, and they didn't think it was right. So Paul said, if I'm going to make them stumble, if I'm going to get them all confused and, and get them in difficulty because I eat meat, I won't eat any meat while I'm there if the, while well, the world stands. I'm not going to do something to stumble them, cause them to stumble, to be a bad example to them. And so many times, you know, we can be doing something and others can look at what we are doing and that would lead them into difficulty. Oh, I can do it if I want it. Yeah, but how does it affect somebody else? Is it a stumbling block? Don't be a stumbling block. A third thing we shouldn't do is bite and devour one another. The book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 15. Galatians 5, 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. If ye bite and devour one another, if you do that... And you shouldn't, is what he's saying there. Don't bite and devour one another. How do you do that? Well, say things that are harmful to them. Uh, say things to others that are bitter, sarcastic, nasty. And just kind of eat them up, uh, you might say. You remember the account of the gingham dog and the calico cat that sat there on the mantle. And I don't remember all the little poem. But they got an awful fight, and when the owners came back, there was just a couple little pieces of fluff and calico left, and they were gone. What happened to them? They ate each other up. I don't know if that's a true story or not, but anyway, that's the, that's the account there, which you read in grade school long ago, I trust. Uh, but uh, Paul says, don't be that way. Don't be chewing other people up. Don't be biting and devouring one another. That's not a good thing to do. Fourth thing you shouldn't do is be provoking one another. Provoking one another. The book of Galatians, chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 26. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another. Suppose you've got an old dog, and he's trying to take a nap. Just about the time he gets to sleep, you come up and jab him in the ribs, and he jumps up and gives you a dirty look and goes back to sleep. Gets sleeping again, you jab him in the ribs again. And he looks up, gives you another dirty look, and looks around a little bit and goes back to sleep. And as soon as he sleeps, you jab him again. One of these times, he's going to rear up and bite your hand. <laughs> you get tired of that. You provoked him too long. You put up with a little while, but enough is enough. And uh, you agitate him, and he'll be provoked and do something he shouldn't do. And we shouldn't do that to other people. You know, it's easy to agitate people. Sometimes we like to give somebody a hard time, and if... Uh, Everybody's doing it in good fun. Well, that's one thing. But if you just agitate somebody and bother them and provoke them, uh, a lot of husbands and wives sometimes provoke each other. Just see how, what, how, how much they can do to make the other person mad. You know, And that's not right. That's not good. Don't be provoking one another. And then in that same verse, he says something else we shouldn't do. Envy one another. 
there in verse 26, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Oh, I wish I had what he has. I wish I had the job that she has. Uh, always wanting something that somebody else has. That's not right. That's not good. That's not good for you. That's not good for them. Don't be envying one another. That's not good. And then in the book of Titus chapter 3, verse 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. He warns about this. Hating one another. Hating one another. Titus chapter 3, verse 3 says, We ourselves also were sometimes or at one time foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We used to be that way. Shouldn't be that way anymore. Hating one another. You know, when you hate someone, you're angry with them, and, and you want to hurt them. You'd like to hurt them. And maybe even if you just imagine awful things that you could do to them or might happen to them, that makes you feel good. Oh, that's not right. You need to get your heart right with God if you feel that way toward anybody. Don't be mistreating one another, hating one another. Well, those things are... Those are things that God mentions we shouldn't do to one another. What about what we should do to one another? Things we should do. There's more things we should do than we shouldn't do mentioned. Ten of these. Uh, first of all, I'll go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned to one another. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. He says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Kindly affection. That means have a soft heart. Be kind. Think about other people's feelings. You don't want to hurt somebody else. Uh, many years ago, I don't remember where it was, but I was talking to somebody and kind of joking, and I said something or other, and then started off on my journey home, and I got to thinking about it. Maybe I'd said that thing in a wrong way and hurt that person, and it hurt their feelings. It meant to be a joke, but... You can joke sometimes to say things the wrong way and hurt somebody. And I got thinking about that, and I had to turn around, go clear back there, and make sure. And sure enough, I hadn't hurt their feelings, but I thought I might have. And you don't want to do that. It's not good. Be kindly affectioned to one another. Have a soft heart for others. Uh, be, be feeling for their feelings. Kindly affectioned. And in that same verse, it says we should be preferring one another. Now Romans chapter 12, the last part of verse 10 with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. What does that mean? Well, that means putting the other person first. Remember when Jesus talked to Warren people, he said, don't, when you go to the feast, don't take the top room. They would each get a room depending on how important they were. Don't take the upper room, go down in the basement. And then uh, later on when they go, oh, you shouldn't be down here, you should come up here. Uh, then you'd feel uh, honored. But if you go up there and they say, oh, you got to, Go back down here, and then you would feel uh, ashamed of yourself. And so, uh, don't take the high room. Uh, that's like treats in the morning time. Don't eat them all up so nobody else has them. You know, same same principle there. Uh, but anyway, preferring one another. And then in Romans 15, verse 7, another principle. It says we ought to be receiving one another. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Wherefore. Receive ye one another, as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. Now, somebody comes along and, well, they're not our type. Uh, they're not like us. They have different ideas. Uh, they're a different age, whatever. And so we just kind of avoid them. Remember, Paul says, Christ took you in. And uh, me, we weren't anything to get excited about, but he took us in anyhow. He did that. And if he received us, why shouldn't we, we receive others? No matter who they are. You say, oh, well, they got a lot of problems. They got Well, then try and help them with their problems, their weaknesses. Receive them so you can help them. Fourth suggestion. Admonish one another. Romans chapter 15, verse 14. I myself am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, Able also to admonish one another. He says, you're good people. You know your Bibles. Therefore, you are able to admonish one another. 
Now, the problem is, too often, the people that do the admonishing are ones that don't know what they're doing, and the ones who know what they're doing don't do the admonishing. Uh, well, uh, you know, Paul says uh, in Galatians, ye who are spiritual, you have some spiritual maturity, uh, you restore such and one. And uh, so we, but we should, if we have a little spiritual maturity and understanding, you've been around a while, you know the Lord, uh, admonish one another. Now that doesn't mean ball them out. But admonish, just encourage them to do right. You ever do that? You ever see some other believer, some Christian friend, and you encourage them to be kind or encourage them to uh, do this or do that? Admonish them, just to encourage them to do it. Uh, turn over just a bit to Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Puts this idea in a different context here. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another how? in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When you're singing... You're, you're admonishing one another. If you're singing from your heart, if you're meaning it, and you're singing like you ought to sing, others might uh, learn something from what you're singing. Uh, Come ye that love the Lord and let your joys abound. Marching to Emmanuel's ground. Uh, admonish one another uh, to do the right things in word and in song. Uh, then, going back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, here's something else you ought to do. Serve one another. Galatians 5, 13, For brethren, ye've been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. When's the last time you've done something for somebody else? Too often we're so busy serving ourselves, looking after our need, our family, and our things, our job. Now, on the other hand, there are some who are always helping somebody. That's wonderful. That's the blessing the church has, to have people who are helping others, serving one another. That's a wonderful attribute, to serve one another. And then going on to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, forbearing one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. What does that mean? That means putting up with other people. Sometimes people can aggravate you, agitate you. Sometimes you have to put up with other people. Forbearing. I get a lot of practice at that, uh, a lot of ways. But particular, there's a lady that used to be here years ago and lives in Florida now and she's always calling me up with all kinds of problems mostly imaginary enough to drive a person crazy and uh, she's the kind of person that uh, if they would say I'm thinking of suicide you're tempting tempted to say that sounds like a great idea today <laughs> but I wouldn't do that of course <laughs> but uh, you know some people can really bother you to death uh, uh, but we uh, don't let people agitate you and get you all out of sorts uh, just because they have some habit that rubs you the wrong way or something. Uh, and maybe they make the same dumb mistake over and over again. But be forbearing. Put up with them. And then in the same uh, chapter here, he says, be, kind of lump, lumps three things together. Be tender-hearted, be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. Ephesians 4.32 be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Uh, well, sometimes people do the wrong things. Sometimes they say things they shouldn't say to you or about you. And what do you do when they hurt your feelings, do something you don't like? You go around with a grudge, make yourself miserable? Oh, well, you know what those relatives did or what those friends did or what that person said? Oh, forgive them. Lord forgave you of everything, and he didn't need to, but he did. And uh, why go around making ourselves miserable and everybody else miserable when we can be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving? After all, we make our mistakes too. We do things wrong. 
expect others to forgive us. Why shouldn't we forgive them? Like the Lord says. Number eight, comfort one another. Comfort one another. First Thessalonians chapter four, that passage about the rapture. And he says there, wherefore, comfort one another with these things. The truths about the rapture, comfort one another. Do you ever comfort anybody except at funerals? Is that the only time you ever comfort anyone? Well, we should be comforting people when we meet them. People have their sorrows, their griefs, their heartaches, and uh, they need comfort, not just when somebody dies. I mean, that's one time, but there are many other times as well. And sometimes we're just too busy to even know that somebody needs some encouragement. Comfort them. Well, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Edify one another. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Why, those people in Thessalonica, they did that. They edified one another, and he encourages them to keep on doing that. What's that mean? Well, to edify means to build somebody up, to help them grow, help them make progress, build them up, make them a stronger Christian. Now, it's real easy to tear down, but it's hard to build up. These young people were working out here in this project uh, last week, and they, there was blacktop there, kind of, and they tore that up in short order. But then to build it up, that took the rest of the week. You know, <laughs> and They tore it up in a few hours. It's easy to tear things down, tear them up or tear them down, whichever way you tear things. But it's easy to destroy, but to build up. That takes longer. That takes a lot of effort. And I wonder in your Christian life, who are you building? Well, where's the people or the person that you are building up? I you know you teachers are trying to build up your students, help them make progress, and that's good. Uh, but uh, build up people. And you know, when you try to do that, it can be discouraging because some people are hard to build up. They just, uh, they just seem stuck and want to stand still. But keep on trying. Build up, edify one another. And then the last one he mentions in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 13. Hebrews 3, 13. Here the apostle says, But exhort one another daily. Well, it's called today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Not some other time. But exhort one another. And do it daily, often, regularly. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. And here again, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see it the day approaching. You know, we need more of that. We need people to be exhorting. And that is just uh, encouraging people to do right, uh, encouraging to do the right things, act the right way. And we need more of that. You see somebody doing wrong, see somebody slipping, somebody missing or whatever, exhort them, encourage them to do right. And we need this. We're lacking that. And uh, again, it's not for the immature, but you who are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, Paul says. And we ought to be exhorting one another. So the bottom line is, of all these things, we ought to be concerned for other people. And there's so many people there alone. They're lonely. They don't have a real friend. They don't know if anybody cares about them. And why shouldn't we be concerned about one another? Call somebody up. Send them a note. Go see somebody. Somebody's in the hospital, you go see them. How many men see Ms. Gillen in the hospital, for instance? Uh, do you... Uh, see people, visitors to church, you get acquainted with them, ever get together with them, a young couple like the hunters, somebody going to get together with them, have them over, go to their house or something, and other people come. Uh, are we concerned for other people? I know, we're all busy, and we get so occupied with ourselves, don't have time to be concerned one for another. But that's what God wants us to do. We're members one of another, members of one body. And in your physical body, if one part of your body has a problem, all your body knows. If your foot hurts, you hurt all over. And all of you is concerned, or whatever. And that's the way it ought to be, as believers in a local body, concerned for one another, not just ignoring one another, not so busy we have no time for others, 
but being concerned one for another. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your care for us. Thank you for each one part of this local body here. Lord, just bless us that we might build up one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, admonish and help one another, love one another as we should, and be concerned for those around us and be a help to their spiritual growth and progress. Lord, let us not be selfish Christians, just enjoying all the blessings we have and not concerned about others. Let us long for your blessings for them as well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.